Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Concussion Center's webinar series, uh, which is sponsored by LAUNA, the Labour's International Union of North America. Uh, my name is Leslie Rattan, and I'm really pleased to be moderating uh, our series, which was developed for people with persistent symptoms of concussion, their families, as well as healthcare providers. So this evening, I'm really uh, pleased to uh, introduce Dr. Abe Snyderman, who if you've been with us, you may have seen him before. And he's gonna be speaking on anxiety, depression, and PTSD before and after concussion. So Dr. Snyderman is an assistant professor in both the Department of Psychiatry and the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is the founding director of the Neuropsychiatry Clinic at the University Health Network, Toronto Rehab Institute, Brain and Spinal Cord Program, where he has worked for the past 25 years. He has been involved in the field of physical and neurological trauma for many years. As a clinician teacher, he has been involved in training medical students, residents, fellows, and ancillary health professionals, as well as the general public for over 25 years. He's a member of the exam board and, and an examiner in psychiatry for the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and winner of the Ivan Silver Award for the Excellence in Mental Health Education given by the University of Toronto. He is also a member of the board of directors and advisory board of several acquired brain injury organizations, initiatives and programs. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Snyderman. Thank you for that kind introduction, Leslie. So that explains why I'm constantly tired. It's a pleasure being here with you in a webinar form, which is not ideal for a presenter because I cannot see you and I can only guess what your reactions are. So hopefully it'll be positive. Let me share my screen. All right, can you see me the screen? Somebody tell me. Yes, looks good. Looks good. All right. So, uh, Leslie just introduced me. So, uh, thank you for being here. As it's always the case, uh, you know what? I'm not being able to move. So, let me just stop sharing and change screens. There was something there. Okay. All right. There you go. So as a disclosure, I have no conflict of interest. I am not affiliated with industry. I'm a clinician teacher, hence no research was part of the making of this presentation. I have 30 minutes to present a rather complex topic. So that usually makes me say, you know what, that one. So talking about brain injury is never easy because we don't really have access to the organ like some of our colleagues in general surgery can. We have to rely on secondary methods of assessment like imaging. Sometimes we do have the availability of brain surgery, but oftentimes we don't. So like the cartoon says, well, we'll know more once we do an MRI, but yes, this could be a career ending injury. So for the purposes of this presentation, we are going to consider the mind and the brain as one entity. This is very important because up to now, up to the 20th century, late 20th century, beginning of 21st, there was always controversy about it. And now there seems to be much less so. In psychiatry, you have lots of stories, lots of anecdotes, but perhaps the most important clinical case is the one this gentleman established. This is Phineas Gage, and this is 1848. Phineas Gage was a worker in the railroad down in the States, and his job was using that tamping iron, was to use the iron to try to set in the dynamite in a hole so that the uh, work and continue establishing railroad. Unfortunately, in one of those attempts, the dynamite exploded and the rod went through his brain. Can you see my pointer? Somebody tells me, please tell me. Can you see my pointer? Yes, I can see it. Thank you. So 
the camera is there, but the screen is there. So if you see me looking sideways, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just looking at the screen. So this unfortunate chap, the road entered under the cheek and exited all the way through the brain. What that does is produced personality change. And in October of 1868, Dr. J.M. Harlow, which is his physician, published an article and this is actually a page from that article. Rather than get you to read all that, I selected some of the relevant stuff. So after the injury, Ms. Dr. Harlow describes them as indulging at times in the grossest profanity, being impatient and obstinate, being uh, capricious and vacillating, and having the intellectual capacity and manifestations of a child, as well as, and I love this one, animal passions. His friends and acquaintances said he was, quote, no longer engaged. It's the first time in literature that a case of almost a lobotomy was described and the patient survived. So clear evidence of a, a patient that sustained a severe traumatic brain injury survived but was no longer himself. A very quick neuroanatomical, neurophysiological and one's function. Um, slide in which I will explain to you what the brain is like from the thinking point of view. So that if you look at the bottom here, the survival brain, it's a basic, really primitive functions we call reptilian brain. So your pulse, your breathing, coughing, nausea, etc., heart rate, all of that is controlled in this area. If we go further up and in the evolutionary scale, further evolved organisms, they develop an emotional brain in which it's the center of the brain, it's still very primitive, and further up what we call the thinking brain or the neocortex, which humans have, which is the blue area. That's what makes us human. That's what makes us uh, be able to function and produce and execute and discern and learn and have feelings that can be interpreted, etc. So how common a problem is it to have psychiatric problems after traumatic brain injury? This is a very well-known article. It's already dated by Brian. In this article, they studied a number of patients and they discovered that 12 months after a brain injury, about a third of patients reported having a psychiatric disorder. 22%, almost a quarter of them, developed a new psychiatric disorder. And the most common psychiatric disorders were depression, 9% to the sample, anxiety, and not surprisingly, post-traumatic stress disorder. Agoraphobia is the fear of going out in public. So surprisingly, up to 6% have it. So how does a brain injury affect mental health? In this very quick slide, I'm going to explain what Carlos Obreja did in 2000. Basically, he developed, he's a biomedical engineer, I believe from France, and he developed this equation in which C equals E over R multiplied by 0.5, in which C is the wave propagation velocity, E resilience of the tissue, and R density of the tissue. This only works in low or medium energy impact. So now you're thinking, come on, Snyder, what, what does that mean? Well, imagine a tsunami, and imagine that in this picture, in this MRI, all of the black lines are energy being transmitted from the vibration in the skull down to the center of the brain, to the reptilian brain. So the first impact hits the skull and produces energy. And because the skull is convex, I mean concave, uh, starts reflecting like a mirror, the energy towards the center of the brain, but as the energy starts getting closer to the center, it starts amplifying very much like a tsunami to the point in which it reaches the center area of the encephalon of the brain and all the structures and produces a higher level of vibration and disruption. Now, you don't even have to have a severe injury or a head injury to produce that. So a check in hockey that shakes the brain enough might be producing this type of thing. This only works if the skull remains intact and is able to vibrate. If the skull breaks, this model doesn't work. So why is this important? 
Well, in the area of the brain right here where the energy condensate, when the energy concentrates or collimates, as we call it, live all of the monoaminergic nuclei that produce the substances known as neurotransmitters. So dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, adrenaline, all of this, some of the forms of uh, noradrenaline neurotransmitters like GABA or exin, which have to do with appetite and sleep regulation. All of those monoaminergic nuclei are in this area. And from this area, they send their substances, the, the neurotransmitters that produce to the rest of the brain through what's called pontine basal cortical relay. So you can imagine if this area is disrupted and all of these fibers are disrupted, there are problems in terms of regulation of mood, regulation of energy, sleep, appetite, attention, concentration, uh, et cetera, behavior. So let's move on to traumatic brain injury and mood syndromes. So what is depression? Well, what makes us feel depressed? Well, we feel helpless when we are depressed. Guilt can make us feel depressed and also makes us, depression makes us feel guilty. Commonly shame, we feel lonely, pain, physical pain, hopelessness, isolation, and what's more commonly produced in depression in Ontario and in Toronto is certain hockey teams lack of a championship, championship week and a win, and I'm not gonna say which team, but you can guess. So this is the criteria for a major depressive disorder. And I tell my residents never put a slide with more than three or four points. So here I am putting this. So I'm gonna basically spare you the trauma of reading this slide and put the most important thing. This is from the Diagnostic and Statistical Method, the DSM-5 of the American Psychiatric Association, which is basically the most important uh, classification in psychiatry. So what is a major depressive disorder? You have to have depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure in daily activities for more than two weeks. This is very important. You have to have impaired function, both social and occupational, could be educational. And you need to have five of the following nine symptoms. Obviously, depressed or irritable mood, the decreased interest or pleasure, weight change by 5%, can go up, can go down, sleep effects, insomnia, or sleeping too much, psychomotor agitation or retardation, fatigue or loss of energy, worthlessness or excessive of inappropriate guilt, and diminished ability to think and concentrate, as well as in severe cases, thoughts of death or suicide, or actually having a suicide plan. To make this even more simple, we can divide a major depressive disorder symptoms in emotional symptoms, which are constant sadness almost every day, worthlessness, excessive inappropriate guilt, suicidal thoughts, intent of actions. And by the way, asking a patient, asking somebody whether they feel suicidal does not increase the risk of suicide. That is a myth that has been disproven many, many times. It actually helps. It helps the patient feel validated, the person feel validated and heard. Loss of interest or pleasure in favored activities. Now, what about the physical symptoms? Low energy, psychomotor impairment means the patient moves slowly, thinks slowly. Aches and pains, insomnia or sleeping too much. As I said, changes in weight, low to absent sex drive and changes in appetite. The behavioral symptoms are restlessness or apathy, both, irritability in patients in, and aggression. And this one particularly is more common in males. We don't know why, and it might be a culturally based phenomena, uh, or it might be that we guys are kind of dumber with our feelings and don't express them appropriately. We get pissed off and angry instead of crying or being emotional in more healthier ways. So somebody who becomes all of a sudden very irritable and impatient when they weren't, I question whether they have a depression underneath. Cognitive symptoms, difficulty making decisions or focusing, very, very common. Problems with attention. And consequently, if you cannot focus and pay attention, how are you going to learn things? And if you cannot learn things, how are you going to remember them? And slow thinking processes, hard to go through concepts. 
Now, depressive disorders, there are many. I cited one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there are more. All of them share sadness, guilt, shame, and irritability, as well as suicidality. The most common one would be major depressive disorder. But in this case, since we're talking about traumatic brain injury, we will be talking about depressive disorder due to a medical condition, which in this case is brain injury. So depressive disorders after traumatic brain injury, what do we know? We know that the frequency is on average six to 77%. And when you see this range of percentages, you know that the research is not exactly great. You cannot have a study in which 6% of the sample shows depression and another study that shows 77%. So there's something difficult there in terms of the methodology. What we do know is that the first year after a brain injury, depression is common, 25 to 50%. In a lifetime, in other words, after a brain injury, the lifetime risk is between a quarter to almost two thirds of patients. The problem with the studies is that the population studies can be heterogeneous, means that they're different populations. The variety of scales tends to be a problem. So some studies use one scale, another study use another scale to measure depression. So we get different results. And there's arbitrary cutoffs for depression. What is considered depression? Those are technicalities. What we do know through a study by Coponen in 2002, and if you want to get really good epidemiological data, you have to go to, to, go to Scandinavian studies. They're fantastic. So Coponen studied 60 patients, which you say, well, not a lot of patients for 30 years. Now, 30 years is a heck of a long time to do a project. So imagine you do 30 years of research and then your project shows that no, the results will false. There goes your career. In this case, it actually so shows that about a quarter of patients in those 60 patients after 30 years had depression after traumatic brain injury. What are the risk factors? A personal history of mood and anxiety disorders, uh, poor social functioning before the traumatic brain injury, the effect of different risk factors over time. And for example, psychosocial factors. Does a, does a person have where to live? Is the person financially in trouble? Is the person alone? Do they have a job? And those are very, very relevant, especially in the chronic stages of traumatic brain injury. But perhaps the most significant factor would be alcohol abuse, not just use, but abuse. What about depression after TBI versus garden variety depression? They are similar in presentation. However, fatigue, pain, and sleep might be related to the problems from brain injury and non-brain injury trauma. Oftentimes, patients who suffer a traumatic brain injury have other injuries, muscle aches, muscle pains, fractures, abdominal surgeries, breathing problems, et cetera. So in regular depression, those would have been attributed to depression, but in brain injury, we have to consider them, are they part of the physical injury per se? Cognitive symptoms might be related to brain injury, not necessarily depression. So we also have to consider that somebody with attentional problems, memory problems, uh, behavioral regulation uh, might be the brain injury, not depression. Irritability, Poor frustration and tolerance, as well as apathy, are very common after traumatic brain injury depression. And also insight deficit secondary to traumatic brain injury. Typically, patients with more often than not severe brain injuries will not recognize that they are depressed or that they even have a brain injury in severe cases. This is a slide courtesy of Statistics Canada. And this slide is a tragedy, no matter how you look at it. It's from 2016, the latest census available to me. And it shows the percentages, the number of suicide, uh, sorry, homicides in 2012, 13, 14, 15, and 16. In Canada, every year, about 400 people, between 400 and 500 people are killed. It's a tragedy. It's nothing compared to what our neighbors in, this, in the South go through or other parts of the world, 
but nonetheless, it's a tragedy. We hear about it in the media all the time. You turn on the news and if it bleeds, it leads. You hear about this all the time. And yet, every year, 10 times more people kill themselves. 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, and you don't hear a word about it. It's a tragedy, and this is called stigma. We don't hear about it because people are embarrassed, and the media has a bias against talking about suicide for fear of inducing suicide, copycats, and they might, they might have some reason in that. I can't blame them for that. However, it stigmatizes mental illness. That's my depressive slide. Now, what are the rates and predictors of suicide during the first year after traumatic brain injury? Michael Prang studied almost 600 adult patients with mild to severe TBI. They use what's called the patient health questionnaire and they interviewed at one, six, eight, 10, and one year after injury. A quarter of the patients reported having suicidal thoughts. And what were the predictors? a prior history of a suicide attempt, history of bipolar disorder, less than high school education, which might indicate less level of sophistication in terms of identifying resources, identifying what's going on um, with their own feelings, their own problems, perhaps level of um, financial ease, uh, job descriptions, and the rates of suicide ideation among traumatic brain injury exceeded by a lot those found in the general population. So we know, let me just change the camera because it's driving me nuts turning around. Sorry about that. Can you see me well? All right. So let's talk now about anxiety, traumatic brain injury and anxiety disorders. I'm gonna show you a video. Hopefully you can hear it. Okay, Peter, I think you know what this chat's about. Well, this is, this is never easy, is it? You've been struggling over the past few months. You've let the team down. I mean, surely you must know what they think of you. <laughs> You're not coping. Say, so, look, I'm sorry, but it's not working. You see, the bottom line is, you're just not good enough. You are a failure. Just because you have a young family, that's no reason to keep you on. I mean, quite frankly, Peter, you'd think a grown man could look after you. Pete, oh, sorry about the last minute catch up. So there's this job I want your input on. It's very similar to the one we have just completed, but the timelines are much tighter. Is it you or anxiety talking? I love the Aussie uh, um, accent. So this is a typical example of what catastrophic thinking is about. And the typical example of what patients go through when they have anxiety. It is not necessarily related to a real situation. It's in their heads and causing impairment in quality of life. There are many anxiety disorder. These are the seven most common. Due to the, the time constraints, we're going to be talking only about generalized anxiety disorder and PTSD. So generalized anxiety disorder, these are the patients that are so-called worry words. They worry excessively about everything, even the smallest of things. It has to be more days than not, at least six months, about a number of events or activities, not just one thing. It is difficult or impossible to control the anxiety, and they have to have at least three associated physical symptoms. The cognitive symptoms in general anxiety disorder go something like what you just heard. Some, something is going to go wrong. This worry is going to make me nuts. I need to be sure nothing bad is going to happen, and this is crucial. It's an issue of trying to control uncontrollable environmental issues. What are the physical symptoms? Muscle tension and pain, feeling keyed up or on edge, restlessness, irritability, sleep disturbance. What are the behavioral? Avoiding news, newspapers, restricting involvement in activities due to excessive worries about what could happen. Typical. So these are people who would 
avoid going on a holiday because they might be afraid the plane's going to crash, they're going to lose their luggage, somebody's going to get sick, they're going to lose their way, they're not going to be able to return in time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of those buzzing, excuse me, little ghosts I call in the brain uh, that uh, affect quality of life. Constantly seeking for excessive reassurance, seeking or over-preparing, like some presenter I might or might not know and giving a webinar one of these days. So the most effective form of treatment for generalized anxiety disorder is not medication, it's cognitive behavioral therapy, it's exercise, meditation, but the best approach in somebody who has not responded is a combination of medication and cognitive behavioral therapy. And in some people who cannot access CBT, we have to go through medications. Excuse me. There is a technique called motivational interviewing associated with cognitive behavioral therapy in Ponsford, again in Australia, run a night week trial of CBT with a three sessions of motivational interviewing. 75 participants, CBT plus motivational interviewing, better outcomes. What is motivational interviewing? A little of what I'm doing with you today, explaining what anxiety is, explaining what the brain injury is, explaining what the anatomy of brain injury is, reassuring the, the sufferer that they are not alone, that this is common, that it is treatable, educating the, the patient on what is anxiety, how does it feel? They're not going crazy. It is a brain issue that can be treated and they can improve. So cognitive behavioral therapy for depression and anxiety in acquired brain injury, what works and for whom? This is a bit controversial. So outcome studies for depression and anxiety in traumatic brain injury and in stroke have had contradictory uh, results. So there's a study that showed by Waldron, what you call a meta-analysis, 24 studies, 500 people with various treatment and control. And what they can, what it become clear that CBT is not for everyone and for every disorder. So cognitive behavioral therapy for anger or coping skills, very effective, but do not generalize necessarily to anxiety or depression after brain injury. CBT for anxiety or depression alone is effective, but you have to be careful who you choose as a therapist. And as a therapist, you have to be careful who is your patient, how motivated they are, um, the level of education, the level of commitment, because CBT is intense. There's lots of things the patient have to do. And for the rest of his life, the young reptiles suffer deep emotional scars. I love Gary Larson, the fireside. It's a shame he stopped it. So let's talk about trauma. And when we talk about trauma, we talk about PTSD. What is PTSD? Everybody has heard about PTSD, either on the news or media of some sort of a friend of a friend that has PTSD. To have post-traumatic stress disorder, you need a traumatic event. It's one of those things my residents say, duh. But yeah, you need a traumatic event. And this sounds easy, but what is a traumatic event? It varies from person to person. The person, the sufferer, has to have preserved recall of the traumatic event. They have to remember it. Otherwise, they won't be able to do the next thing, which is reliving of the traumatic event. And reliving can come in the form of nightmares, flashbacks, feeling that you're back at the scene of the trauma, not just remembering the trauma, but literally at the scene of the trauma. And intrusive thoughts, unwelcome intrusive thoughts of the trauma. As a consequence of all this, the person develops avoidance of situations that remind them of the trauma or circumstances surrounding the event. So if somebody who's involved in a car accident, they might be terrified of driving and avoiding driving. There's heightened arousal, they're tense all the time. They hear a noise and they jump. 
there's negative effect on mood a negative effect on cognition and we've learning more about traumatic brain injury and these are studies come from israel uh from the the wars they've been through and realizing that soldiers as well as the american army coming after they withdrew withdrew from iraq uh having many many soldiers with ptsd and realizing that people who suffer ptsd actually might have neurological damage uh in areas that affect attention concentration and memory as i just said sleep appetite energy and sex drive libido are disrupted now all of these symptoms have to last at least a month and this is important in psychiatry in neuropsychiatry if there isn't functional decline there's no disorder if you are able to function doesn't mean you're not suffering but you don't necessarily have ptsd or depression or bipolar or panic disorder you have the symptoms but not necessarily the disorder so as i said post traumatic stress disorders in tbi most studied anxiety are in tbi are military cohorts we have very little information outside of this the diagnosis and i've been in this business for 30 years and i can tell you it's not easy it requires a long interview and oftentimes longitudinal following to really get the diagnosis right consequently the delay in diagnosis is common people feel embarrassed about it and don't talk about it they don't like to explore it anterograde post traumatic amnesia strangely enough or not might be a protective factor so if you suffered a severe traumatic brain injury in a car accident and you were unconscious for 2 weeks and you don't remember a month before the accident and about 3 months after the accident you wake up and all of a sudden you're at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute and Snyderman is looking at you and you don't know what happened consequently if you cannot remember what happened if you don't remember the trauma how are you going to develop post traumatic stress disorder now you can develop post traumatic stress disorder by what happened after that all the losses you've had and the pain physical and emotional uh, changes in your life yes that yes in mild traumatic brain injury and concussion definitely you can develop post traumatic stress disorder because most people with concussions and persistent symptoms of concussions will remember more or less what happened it can also happen in moderate and severe tbi but there's less reliving obviously because you cannot remember and more hyper arousal tension and avoidance i've never forget this patient i keep on repeating this anecdote but it's very illustrative 72 year old who gets assaulted left for dead with a severe traumatic brain injury in her culture she was unfortunately sexually uh, assaulted too in her culture being sexually assaulted being raped is very shameful so the family hit from her the fact that she had been sexually um abused sex, uh, raped and left for dead when she arrived here she had no memory of the incident she was told that she uh, had fallen down the stairs and that she sustained a brain injury unfortunately at some point the police needed to interview her so about 3 months after the incident two big burly sergeants came to interview her and we were able to delay it until we prepared the patient with the family after she was told what had happened the patient who up to now was participating in therapies really well coming out of the room going out for walks around Toronto rehab not a problem became reclusive not coming out of her room unable to sleep barricading her room so it's an example of how somebody who sustained a severe brain injury was traumatized but something that had happened before and developed PTSD yet not related to the trauma itself this is the problem so here you have persistent post concussive syndrome here you have ptsd and these are the symptoms they share so depression and anxiety insomnia irritability anger 
trouble concentrating, fatigue, hyperarousal, avoidance. In PTSD, you have the re-experiencing, the shame and the guilt. In persistent post-concussive syndrome, you have the physical aspects, headaches, phonophobia, photophobia, sensitivity to light and sound, memory deficits, and dizziness. Now, all of them share the symptoms, so it is really hard to tease out what is PTSD and what is persistent syndromes of, uh, symptoms of concussion and what might be depression or sleep disorders. Because brain injuries result from biomechanical trauma, so if you are in a serious car accident, those forces, as I explained at the beginning, might cause neurological damage, but also psychologically traumatic experiences. Being in the car with your kids, for example, and even if you don't lose consciousness, you would be terrified that something might have happened to the kid behind. So this, the same neuroanatomies are shared, and that's why they share perhaps underlying mechanisms. Now, what do we do with PTSD and TBI? For the treatment of PTSD, PTSD, PTSD we result to cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitive processing therapy, neurorehabilitation, and in some cases, substance use treatment. Many patients with post-traumatic stress disorder, unfortunately, resort to either alcohol or other substance use to treat their symptoms. And we also recommend exercise. So cognitive uh, processing therapy, it's a form of CBT that has a manual. So it's, it's through a manual. So very quickly, the trick is to avoid avoidance of the triggers. So if you are triggered, by driving, do not avoid driving. Education about the symptoms of PTSD and their treatment, making the patient aware of the negative thoughts being just thoughts and how those thoughts are associated with feelings. I call feelings thoughts with flavor, so to speak. My residents think it's kind of cheesy, but I don't care. And Another part of this is skill development to challenge or question those negative thoughts, not because you're thinking something negative means that it's going to happen. Otherwise, if you really think hard that you're going to win the lottery, you might win the lottery. So you don't have the power of alter that just by thinking it. Thinking something catastrophic doesn't mean it's going to happen. Now, this is, this is the big stinker when it comes to diagnosing post-concussive syndrome and anxiety and mood disorders after a traumatic brain injury. It's called somatic symptom disorder. These are people who have a significant focus on physical symptoms, such as pain or weakness or dizziness, um, smells or sight or sounds that result in major distress and, again, problem functioning. The thoughts that they produce are out of proportion with the seriousness of the symptoms. So the doctor can't find anything. They go through umpteen testing, sophisticated testing of imaging and lab, and nothing is found. They, there is high level of anxiety about health or symptoms. There's excessive time or energy spent on the symptoms and health concerns. And the physical symptoms may or may not be associated with a diagnosed medical condition like concussion. Now, they are not faking it. This is being studied very, very thoroughly over the past 20 years, and it's becoming clear that our neurological areas that are affected in these patients, these are patients that are suffering a legitimate illness. It's not reflective in a physical, and I hate, again, mind versus brain. It's the same. Your brain is the one processing pain and fear. Your brain is the one processing diarrhea or constipation or nausea or dizziness or vomiting. So that's an artificial distinction. These are people who actually have an illness, but they cannot find a physical cause and eventually end up being even more anxious and depressed. We have to rule that out when we're talking about persistent symptoms of concussion. So what happens after a brain injury? It's one brain and 10 people affected. Depression and anxiety are very common. Oftentimes there's caregiver burnout. 
there's a sense of being a burden from the patient, access to care, there's physical and access barriers, knowledge of brain and spinal cord injury. These are usually complex cases in which there's financial, social, and oftentimes medical legal issues. So what happens? The person sustain a mild brain injury any way you want. They develop headache, dizziness, and fatigue. If they have a predisposition towards anxiety or depression or somatic concerns, or they're under stress because of other reasons, they develop, understandably, fear and anxiety if these symptoms don't resolve after a number of weeks. That fear and anxiety produces heightened perception, which produces more anxiety, but also headache, dizziness, and fatigue perception. Then they start developing catastrophic thinking. It's been two weeks. It's been three months. My symptoms are not getting better. I'm never going to get better. I'm going to lose my job, my family, my reputation. What am I going to do? And all of that triggers or emphasizes even more depression, which, as we saw, has somatic symptoms like headache, dizziness, fatigue, and that's the feedback loop. So what's the treatment? Again, cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness. I recommend this book, Mind Over Mood, by Dennis Greenberger and Christine Podesky. Easy to read, patient-friendly, a manual, not difficult to understand. It can be done in groups or individual, social network, groups like this groups in the community that help people with brain injury, like cheers, family involvement, structure, consistency, and empathy are necessary and part of the clinician. Treatment. I named my dog five miles so I can tell people that I walk five miles every day. Exercise is one of the most under, under prescribed, undervalued, and yet extremely effective way of treating anxiety, depression, and symptoms of concussion. It has to be a gradual start as tolerated, but pushing slowly. Frequency is more important than type or duration of exercise. So exercising every day or five times a week might be more important than what you do. The goal is five times 30, five days a week for 30 minutes. And if you can do more than that, fantastic. The goal is to increase heart rate, breathing rate. You have to sweat. You have to have a good Schwitzner. And there are excellent beginner videos on YouTube. There's a series called uh, Walk at Home. Fantastic videos, low impact YouTube channel. I don't get any sponsorship for them. I get no benefit, but I find it very useful. So take home message. Mind is brain. Mental health is brain health. Psychiatric disorders are very common after brain injury. Depression is the most common, followed by anxiety, and both can coexist. Physical and cognitive symptoms after brain injury might be related to depression and or anxiety. Physical symptoms can precipitate mental health problems and vice versa. Depression and anxiety disorders are highly treatable. And I am a positive guy, so attitude is everything. Just tell it to me straight, doc. Can I still run? this weekend. And with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Dr. Snyderman. That was excellent. I think we will jump right into the questions. Uh, the first one, really good one, is the depression, is depression caused by feeling pain all the time or from an organic change to the brain? Once again, we're dealing with mind versus brain. I don't like that I use it and I'm guilty of it, but the term organic is a bit of a misnomer because everything is brain. When a patient tells me my GP sent me because he thinks it's all in my head, I answer your GP is right. That's where your brain is. It's in your head. So yes, chronic pain is depressogenic, can produce depression. I'm not a pain specialist, but there is connectivity be between pain modulating regions in the brain, and I'm not gonna get technical. The interpretation of the brain, the, the interpretation of the, of the pain by the brain, what it means to have chronic pain, 
sense of hopelessness and helplessness. This treatment is not working. What's going to happen? Development of catastrophic thinking, poor sleep because of pain, lack of activity, physical deconditioning. You don't use it, you lose it. Uh, so yes, those two are highly associated. Can chronic pain cause depression? Yes. Can chronic depression cause physical pain? Likely. Great. That's a long answer for a simple question. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, the next individual says, while I've had some degree of anxiety much of my life, I had never had panic attacks until after the concussions. Could this change be the result of the brain injury? Excellent question. The truth of the matter is I don't know. Panic attacks, remember one of the first slides I showed you in the center of the brain where all of the monoaminergic nuclei live and they produce uh, neurotransmitters? There's one particular area called the locus ceruleum. In Latin means the blue node because when they looked at it in the microscope, it kind of looked bluish. Um, many studies have shown that the locus ceruleus is one of the triggering points for panic attacks. So if somebody has a high threshold of anxiety, a low threshold of anxiety, high levels of anxiety, it is likely that undergoing a traumatic event further sensitizes all of the limbic area, the reptilian brain, and then above the emotional brain, so that it can come to the point in which it activates, it triggers the locus ceruleum, and then develops a panic attack. Now, I didn't want to get into panic attacks, and that's another controversial thing because panic attacks are panic has become a bit of a colloquial term. I am panicking because I have my presentation in 25 minutes and I don't have the link, <laughs> or the uh, my it's my wedding and my dress just ripped. I'm panicking. Or the maple leaves lost again, I'm panicking. That shouldn't be a panic. You should be used to that. But that's not necessarily a panic attack. A panic attack is when somebody develops an extreme level of just pure, unadulterated terror. It's the, the mother of all fears. You feel that something catastrophic is about to happen. You feel your body, you feel almost out of your body your heart is racing. It's a complete adrenaline shot. Your heart is racing. You cannot breathe properly. You, since you're hyperventilating, you start feeling dizzy. You start feeling numb in your hands. I can actually trigger a pseudo panic attack in you if I make you hyperventilate for a minute because there's chemical changes in your blood that the locus ceruleum doesn't like. So can a concussion cause panic attacks? Hard to tell, can somebody with a tendency towards anxiety then go on to develop panic attacks likely? Okay, great, thank you. What differences in anxiety and depression have you found in people with frontal lobe injury versus people with damage to the back of the head, the back of the brain? I like to think of the brain as a mobile or mobile. And I mean one of those 3D puzzles, you're hang from the ceiling and you touch one thing and everything moves. Um, we, we have learned, and there are people on the audience that are way more qualified than me to explain this, but we've learned that the brain is not different areas functioning independently. It's a network. It's the mother of all computer networks. It's the mother of all webs. Um, and everything is connected. We used to think that the cerebellum at the back of your head only dealt with balance and motor coordination. And now we know that has huge emotional components. Now, depression itself, and these, these are studies that are now 20, almost 30 years old. Um, there's functional imaging studies that have shown that when certain areas of the frontal and temporal lobes are not talking to each other, when the middle of the brain is not talking to the sides of the frontal lobes and to certain areas in the front, when they're not talking and one area is more active than the other, depression happens. Many, many situations can cause that. Mm -hmm. Can somebody have a back of the head injury and then develop depression? Absolutely, because then I'm gonna ask you, how do we know that it's only the back of the head? Did the person, 
fall backwards in the snow on the ice and hit his his or her head and then gets depression gets a concussion depression they might as well have had a coup and counter coup injury with the frontal temporal lobes there might be other things affecting temporal lobes or frontal lobes other than back of the head it is more common to have for example the literature in stroke shows and stroke neurologists fight about this all the time well not fight but argue about this all the time um, the closer the uh, the stroke is to the front of the brain the more the likelihood of developing post-stroke depression some say on the left some say on the right some say bilaterally so definitely injury to frontal temporal areas is probably more associated with depression but i wouldn't exclude anybody suffering for example, a stroke right center of the brain in the basal ganglia and then developing the pressure or somebody with a severe concussion in which we don't see a lot of frontal symptoms and yet they're depressed. So, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Is there a difference between having a mild brain injury versus a more severe brain injury just in terms of mental health symptoms? We're talking about two different things. Um, yes and no. Yes, both conditions have neuropsychiatric symptoms, mental health issues. Somebody with severe brain injury, somebody with a severe catastrophic brain injury in which the neurosurgeon has to go in and literally take pieces of the brain out because there was a bullet wound to the head or a severe bleed or a severe car accident where there was massive bleed inside, they will have a different level of mental health issues. There might be more issues with memory, attention, concentration, face recognition, behavioral control, um, apathy, problem regulating, normal functioning in society, biological functions they might also have other physical injuries that are uh, producing more mental health issues so both groups will have mental health issues the severe traumatic brain injury would have more behavioral and severe cognitive sequela or consequences than the mild traumatic brain injuries having said so and interestingly at least in my experience the severe traumatic brain injury patients will come to the attention of the neuropsychiatrist or psychiatrist more readily than a mild traumatic brain injury. Because they would the, the, the team involved in acute care would immediately pick up there are psychiatric issues. While a concussion, a mild traumatic brain injury might go weeks without diagnosis, or they might go to a walk-in clinic or to eMERGE and they, they're told, yes, you had a concussion, now go home and turn off your computer, not anymore. Don't watch any TV, not anymore. Don't watch any music. Become a hermit in your room. No lights, no reading, nothing. We don't do that anymore. So paradoxically, a severe traumatic brain injury after times gets treatment faster. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. John is asking, is there data on incidence of new onset psychiatric condition following TBI stratified by the severity so for example concussion versus moderate versus severe in terms of the new onset psychiatric condition the pons for study showed that so yes there, there's there's indicators that the severe traumatic brain injuries will have more likelihood of developing in a lifetime uh, major neuropsychiatric conditions the mild traumatic brain injuries that go on to develop post persistent post-concussive syndrome, which is about 10% of concussions, which uh, it's unfortunately um, very hard to diagnose and treat uh, syndrome after so many trials of treatments uh, do develop uh, mental health challenges. And I would say that in concussion, the mental health challenges after the initial stages, when the lightheadedness and the, the ringing the ears, the vision and 
noise disruption, the pains, et cetera, start to subside, become the more prominent ones. I'm not sure if I answered the question. Okay, great. No, that's excellent. I know we're almost at time, but I think if you're okay, we may go just a little bit over to try and get in as many questions as possible. You get me um, talking, I talk. <laughs> if the audience puts up with me and there's still okay. 60, 63 survivors. Yeah, it looks like everybody's still there. So um, where can someone get help for PTSD after a fall? And this isn't work or automobile related. Oh, yeah. mm. Mental health resources are very scarce. We have a huge crisis worldwide of mental health resources. We have a huge, even bigger crisis of neuropsychological, neuropsychiatric mental health resources. Um, in somebody who has a concussion and developed PTSD, the first would be to contact the family physician get screened to see if it is PTSD. The second would be, um, do they have the means of go outside of OHIP? If they have the means, either through employment uh, benefits or other ways, uh, going outside of OHIP, you would probably get treatment of PTSD faster through a psychologist, neuropsychologist, a social worker. Center for Addiction and Mental Health, CAMH, has a group for PTSD. UHN, I should have started with UHN since I work at UHN. Anyway, that's a commercial. There's a group for anxiety disorders, Sonnybrook, St. Mike's, but the waiting lists are horrendous. Um, nothing we can do about it until we get more resources and more people dealing with the issue. Canadian Mental Health Association might have resources. If you go online and you Google Anxiety Disorders Canada, which I think they say they changed the website to Anxiety Canada, there might be resources there. There are resources on YouTube channels. Um, I, I wish I had a better answer. I wish I had yeah. a better, more yeah. resources to recommend. Okay, thank you. Uh, any data on whether cannabis use disorder, um, I think, or like maybe it means or alcohol use disorder are risk factors, or sorry, like alcohol use disorder is a risk factor for post TBI psychiatric conditions? Yes, and yes. Okay. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time, but definitely alcohol, apart from being cancer inducing is a neurotoxin at any dose. This is where my patients hate me. They call me a killjoy. <laughs> Cannabis is basically a dimmer on your brain. So it produces some of the effects that people seek like a calming effect, but in the long run, depresses attention, concentration, um, motivation to do things, energy, eventually memory and affects mood. I have a heck of a time um, regulating a patient with a brain injury, whether it's severe or mild, if they're, if they're a constant use of cannabis. I have an impossible task if they're using alcohol consistently daily. It's I'm giving them medications to bring up their mood and they taking, they're taking downers. Same for the Z medication, Zopiclon, Zaleplon, Zolpidem for sleep. Same for the PAMs, Lorazepam, Diazepam, Colonazepam, uh, Adivan. Mm -hmm. They're downers and affect mood. So yes and yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sasha is asking, if you've developed PTSD after the fourth trauma endured, can it make you relive the traumas that happened before you develop PTSD? It's a very interesting question. And I'm going to chicken out. I'm not a PTSD researcher. Most of the PTSD, very large studies come from Rachel Ben Yehuda, either from Israel or now in the States, because they have huge samples. Um, it is hard to say. 
Can a new onset PTSD reinforce previously existing trauma? Maybe, depends on what trauma we're talking about. Depends on whether it was PTSD before or not. Depends on how long it lasted. It is possible that a severe trauma sensitizes certain areas of the brain, certain anxiety circuitry, for lack of a better term, that makes the patient more prone to PTSD. Um, there's a lot of debate in that, and I don't necessarily follow the PTSD without brain injury literature. So right. I'm chickening out that one. Apologies, Sasha. No, that's great. How does one access cognitive processing therapy? I don't know. It's still experimental. There was one study I found for uh, processing therapy, cognitive processing therapy in brain injury. It was small. It's still developing. I mention it because the concept involved in cognitive processing therapy can be implemented through mindfulness, through cognitive mindfulness-based therapy, MCBT, which is readily available. You can even do it yourself uh, at home. There are many YouTube videos on how to do mindfulness. We at TRI have a group called LEAP, L-E-A-P, uh, with fantastic mindfulness-based videos. Plug, plug. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The only the only other thing I would say on that one, the Ontario Psychological Associ oh. Association has a find a psychologist function. So you go on to the OPA website, find a psychologist, and then you can enter a number of different search criteria. And I believe that one of them is actually type therapeutic approach. So you could check that as well. It might actually have, you may be able to find individuals that have that specifically listed. So um, Leslie is asking, when you mention neuro, neuro rehabilitation, are you referring to CBT like therapies or something else? No, we're talking about something else. So neuro rehabilitation would be occupational therapy, speech therapy, physiotherapy, neuropsychological testing and neuropsychological treatment like Dr. Rutan does here at TRI. Um, yes, you can do as part of the neuro rehabilitation, cognitive behavioral therapy for sure, but it's a much wider form of therapy. Great, thank you. Matt is asking, can you share some generalized treatment recommendations for someone who's been suffering with persistent uh, symptoms for some five plus years and feels that their untreated depression and anxiety have reached a critical point? This person is already using exercise to mitigate concussion symptoms and to, and to improve mood and energy. Has this person, okay, without getting too technical, and remember, I'm not giving medical advice here because I don't know the cases. So take this as an educational session. Um, if the person has been worked up for any other medical conditions, a thyroid problem, anemia, B12, iron deficiency, or the nutritional issues? Are there any other comorbidities that could be causing the persistence of the symptoms? Are there any other psychiatric conditions? Are there any other social, financial, uh, psychological issues? Are there any pre existing psychological traits? Is there substance use? If all of those says no, 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 uh, my, my next step would be get him assessed through the family physician by a psychiatrist. It's going to take time. Uh, make sure that there's not a mood disorder. And at that point, I would definitely start on an antidepressant at a very low dose and very slow. Uh, any. A family doctor can start. Typically, uh, a patient after concussion, they become very sensitive to side effects. So we start really low and really slow, but eventually they tolerate it and they do really well. So if five years has gone on, gone on and the symptoms persist and everything else has been ruled out, uh, I would say look into the psychiatric underlying conditions and empirically treat aggressively and see what happens. Okay. If you're experiencing PTSD symptoms, but not impacting functional abilities, how does one treat this? A trauma-based provider or EMDR or simply your own psychiatrist? <laughs> EMDR, oh yeah. 
I, I know about EMDR and I am a bit of a skeptic. I know there's studies, but the reason why I'm a skeptic is I'm yet to see a study that is of good quality of long enough duration that has been replicated by different sites in brain injury or concussion. There might be out there and I'm just ignorant about them, but I'm not a big fan of EMDR. Um, it might work really well for non-brain injury PTSD, which is where it started. Um, and I have nothing against it. I cannot comment on EMDR. Uh, the rest of the question was about how you treat PTSD. I lost track. Yeah, I think it was, they had indicated they had symptoms of PTSD, but they weren't actually uh, functionally. But they were affected. functional. Yeah, okay. functional. So depends on what the symptoms are. If the symptoms are based on re-experiencing the trauma and that is causing avoidance, as I tell my patients, avoidance is a no-no. Avoidance is poison. The more you avoid something, the bigger it becomes. It's like the monster under the bed. Is it there? Is it not there? Until you look under, you won't find out. And it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So avoidance is a no-no. Relaxation strategies are really important. Exercise is really important. Talking to somebody, anybody, whether it's a lay therapist, a psychologist, a family doctor, a psychiatrist, about the issue of anxiety and how is it affecting other areas of your functioning. But if you're able to function, that's a good sign. That's a good prognostic sign. Mm -hmm. So you need to get the right, the right treatment for that. But for PTSD in a functioning patient, I'd say focus on not avoidance, focus on exposure. Leslie, you, you treat patients too. If you wanna jump in, please jump in. No, that makes total sense. Okay, I think we'll go with one more question. We've gone way over time and keeping you way too long. Uh, from Brian, any good papers discussing differences between PTSD and PPCS, so persistent uh, post-concussive uh, syndrome, I assume, and potential treatment differences? I had a moderate T TBI, and I've been told that I have both PTSD and uh, PPCS by various doctors and and tests. Um, is, the, is the person asking the question a health provider, mental health provider or a health provider? That I'm not sure. Uh, Brian didn't indicate whether they are or not, so. Okay, McAllister, the McAllister paper that I showed you, the two, the Venn diagram with two circles, it's a Tom McAllister paper. That's one, I think it's in the American Psychiatric Association Journal. So Tom McAllister, M C A L. L-I-S-T-E-R. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'll just remind everyone, I, I apologize. There were a few more questions that, that we weren't able to get to, but do keep in mind, there's one in there about headache uh, uh, from Alex. Just know that we actually had a whole session on headaches that you can go back and watch with Dr. Marie Slager. Um, and also just introductory ones, you know, if you go right back to the beginning to hear about general recommendations post concussion. But with that, I just like to thank you, Dr. Snyderman, so much for an excellent presentation and answering all of these questions and staying late this evening. Uh, really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. And as I always say in my presentations, we presenters live and die by your evaluation. So Take yeah. yourself five minutes and rate it, whether you hate it. Not even five. It. It's it's two it's minutes. Two I minutes. <laughs> whether you love it or hate it. Yeah, please do. Uh, that will come. You'll that will be sent out after the session. So we really welcome your feedback and suggestions. Uh, so thanks again, and we'll be back in two weeks. And I will actually be presenting in two weeks. Uh, on, You're in for a treat. But yeah. <laughs> strategies for mental health and Dr. Snyderman will be back again uh, two weeks after that. So to punish, have... to punish more people who yeah. deserve to be punished. <laughs> thank you, Christian, that's behind the scenes doing all the yeah. AP, which you don't get to see. And thank you, Leslie, for uh, introducing me and coordinating all of this series. Thank you. Well, hope everyone has a good night. Take care. Bye.